Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks for the introduction. And I appreciate that, those uh, comments that, you know, uh, the interest uh, kind of can ebb and flow. And QoS is one of these foundational technologies, uh, the same as security, high availability, and even routing for that matter, where it really is present in all network designs. It's, it, it's so uh, intrinsic to the overall requirements of a given network design that we probably maybe just take it for granted that it's there. But as these business applications and work patterns continue to evolve and change, so do the specifics and the policies required in order to deliver the services. So it's, it's an interesting reflection to see that that interest in QoS is a technology that's been around in various forms for a long time, but because it's so foundational, it's always going to be part of our design. So it's good to uh, go over that and to appreciate the interest in this um, technology. So let's get into the next session in this um, group. So we covered KillWest design best practices and strategies that showed us how to give consideration to our end-to-end QoS designs, recognizing that QoS is very much like a chain and it's only as strong as the weakest link. So we have to have that overall view in place of how every part of the network is going to connect and interact from a service level perspective. Now we're going to take a closer view on one specific area of the chain, and that's the enterprise campus. So for this particular session, we're going to look at tactical design. So one level of detail beyond the strategic design, which is end to end. Now we're going to look at this particular place in the network. What are the tools available to us? What are the design best practice recommendations for enabling those tools? Where and how do, should we turn them on? And then we'll get right down into configuration level detail, like right in the dirt um, level views of the configurations for the CAT 2960, 3560, 3750, as well as the 4500 and 6500. We're going to look at the, the 2K, 3K at the access layer. 4500 primarily as a distribution layer switch, and uh, 6500 primarily in the role of a core layer switch, although all of these are to a degree interchangeable and they could be found at the access edge. But we'll focus on these particular uh, roles, if you will. Okay, with that being said, let's take a look at the first part of our discussion, the considerations and recommendations. Why do we need QoS in the campus? What do you guys think? What are we looking to control here? Is it latency? Is it jitter? Is it packet loss? Is it something else? Well, the answer is packet loss. We're not concerned about latency. Latency is actually a fixed quantity, uh, you know, how long a packet takes to travel from point A to point B. In an enterprise campus network, because of the speeds involved and the approximately geographic lo locality of a campus network, we're dealing with, you know, a few milliseconds at best. Jitter is even less. Uh, but what we are concerned about and the whole point of our policies in the campus is to control packet loss. Now, why are we so concerned about packet loss when we have such high-speed networks? Well, it's exactly for that reason that we need to be concerned because the higher the speed of the network, the faster we can overrun our interface buffers and the sooner we can start dropping packets. For instance, in giggy, 10 giggy, Networks, we can be dropping packets in as few as 10 milliseconds of uh, line rate burst. Now, why is this a concern? Well, in the previous session, we talked about uh, QoS uh, strategic design best practices, and one of the things we noted was that video is becoming the dominant type of traffic on the network. Uh, 80 to 90 percent of internet traffic will be video. Uh, within just a few years, according to our latest visual networking index study, uh, by the end of 2017, in fact. So when we're dealing with this type of video, we realize that it's extremely, extremely drop sensitive. We'll do a little math and we'll show how drop sensitive, uh, but a basic key takeaway is to at least 100 times more sensitive to packet loss than voice over IP alone. So we'll see why that is, but basically because these applications are so drop sensitive, because the speeds are so fast and the buffers are finite, we are looking to control our packet loss. That's the whole point of our QoS policies in the campus. Let's look at why we say this. Let's break down video. 
So video, the dominant application, as we've already mentioned, HD is obviously preferred standard definition. Anyone that has the choice will typically gravitate to the uh, higher uh, level of quality. If we say 1080p, what that means is that there's 1,080 lines of horizontal resolution. There's an industry standard widescreen aspect ratio of 16 by 9, and that means that there's 1,920 lines of vertical resolution. You multiply those two lines together, and you get 2 million pixels per frame of video. Each one of these pixels has at least three bytes worth of information representing color. And so you convert that from bytes to bits by factoring by eight. And then that's a single frame of video. If we're transmitting at 30 frames per second, we multiply all that together, and we can see that a full 1080p uh, HD video stream, if we did not compress it, it would represent one and a half gigabits per second of information a tremendous amount of information. It's uh, completely unfeasible to send these on our networks uncompressed. Just a few of them would bring down even the most highly provisioned networks. However, we have uh, advanced codecs that can uh, perform different type of compression. We call um, two main compression techniques are called spatial compression and temporal compression. Spatial compression compares each pixel of a given frame with the pixels around it, adjacent to it or nearby, and see how much one pixel varies from the ones nearby. Um, temporal compression compares how much a pixel changes from one frame of video to the next frame and to the next frame over time. So when we have uh, video images that, uh, first of all, don't have a lot of complex patterns within them, then we can compress them to a high degree. If we have video images that don't change a lot from one frame of video to the next, we can, again, compress them to a high degree. Conversely, if we have images of, you know, say, people in plaid shirts that are moving and dancing and jumping and uh, the camera is panning, tilting, zooming, all of these things will um, reduce the amount of compression that we can achieve. Long story short, our HD264 uh, uh, compression algorithms, we can compress these um, 1080p streams down to 3 to 5 megabits per second. So that's like a 300 to 1 compression ratio. Now what happens if you drop a packet that's basically representing information that's been compressed to by a 300 to 1 ratio? Well, obviously, then that amount of loss is proportionally magnified by the same amount. So if you lose one packet, even in 10,000, you can, as an end user, notice the visual artifact in the form of pixelization, in the form of uh, any type of blurring or aber visual aberration um, of the overall video stream. Now, for voice over IP, we could conceal the loss of a single packet in a row. We would do this by using packet loss concealment algorithms, which basically would play out the last uh, sample of audio. We would take typically uh, 50 packets per second of audio, which means you're going to take a sample every 20 milliseconds. If you lose one packet, you just play the previous 20 milliseconds, and that loss is concealed. So we would set the target for packet loss for voice over IP to be 1%, no more than 1%. With vo video over IP, particularly high definition video, even one packet lost in 10,000 is noticeable. You cannot conceal that loss from the end user.